Oh, this is so good. It is good to be back in Lindell. I know a third of you really well, and I've told you in the Bible class. Two-thirds of you, I have a clue who you are, and that's great. I want to thank the elders for inviting me. I want to thank the elders and thank Chris and for all the teachers that have been doing the work because I see that God has given the increase. And I thank God for all of your work together in the kingdom, and it is so encouraging just to be back with you. For those of you that I don't know yet, I'm really looking forward to the week of getting to know you, learning who you are, and becoming friends with you. Let's get to the crux of the matter. We are saved by grace through faith. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. From Romans chapter 5 and verse 2, we have access to the grace of God by faith. And so you need to understand, it is truly not of works that any man should boast. If all of us get what we deserve in judgment day, we're all going to hell. None of us deserve to be with God. In order to understand what we mean when you're saying you're saved by grace through faith, you have to define grace, you have to define faith. When we say the term grace, we're not talking about irresistible grace of Calvinism. You are not going to be zapped with some mysterious power that's going to force you to have faith and force you to believe and force you to glorify God and force you to love God and force you to go to heaven. You remember our Bible class? Irresistible grace? Is it from God or is it from men? It's from men. It's made up from the imagination of John Calvin. It's not true. When we're talking about grace, it's an old definition, but basically it's correct. Unmerited favor. But when we're talking about unmerited favor, you've got to understand this has to do with all the spiritual blessings that are in Christ. And so when you start listing off all the spiritual blessings that are in Christ, including even the word of God that comes through the mediator Jesus Christ, every spiritual blessing you enjoy, the privilege of prayer, all of them are by the grace of God. The mercy of God, as we often talk about, is the flip side of grace to where we do not receive the punishment we deserve for sinning against our God. Not only do we not receive the punishment we do deserve, we receive grace. The way this is accessed is by faith. Our sermon this morning is going to be an in-depth study of the different aspects of faith so you can come to understand the role that faith is playing in your relationship with your God and your salvation with your God. The best place to start is over in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. This is the definition that God gives of faith. By the way, I noticed that a lot of you don't have my outlines. I think Chris gives them to you after. I give them to you before so you can keep up. <laughs> I use a lot of verses. And if I say turn, I'm going to start talking about it and reading it before you get there. And you're going to be going, oh, keep up with the preacher. So it would probably be easier for you if you pick up my outlines before you come in, and that way you can focus on the lesson. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so there are things I hope for, things I've never seen that I believe are true, and I have the assurance it's true. I have the assurance this is what's going to happen in my future. And even though I haven't seen God, I haven't seen Jesus, I haven't seen heaven, I haven't seen hell, I didn't see Jesus crucified, I didn't see him raised, I didn't see any of the miracles. And yet I believe it all is true. Faith is defined here again as things that you're having assurance of things you're hoping for, but you honestly believe with full assurance this is the way it's going to be, even though you haven't seen it. 
What I want to do with you right now is start looking into the scriptures at what I call the different aspects of faith. The first aspect of faith is the believing of faith. Let me explain this to you. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. So here we're talking about the believing aspect of faith. You cannot please God without faith. You can't have access to the grace of God without faith. Number one, at the very beginning, you have to believe that God is. That's where it all starts. Remember the class I told you? I can't answer that question. Why well, I even believe in God? I can explain to you in great detail now why I believe in God. I got a whole series of lessons on evolution and creation. I got a whole lessons that I worked up on the, the flood of Noah. I, I can explain to you precisely why I believe in God. To be a Christian, you must believe that God exists. That's the beginning point of it all. Continuing now the next verse, John chapter 20, 30-31. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. You remember I told you earlier, when we were taking the Lord's Supper, it all comes down to who do you say that he is. And when I was trying to figure out who Jesus is, where I went to was the Bible. And in the Bible, as I started reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I started reading about all these miracles that Jesus did. And so I have to ask myself this question. Is this telling me the truth? Is this true? Is this true about what Jesus did? The text here in John is explaining to you the reason we have the recording of the miracles. It's so that you can read about them and come to the conclusion somebody you've never seen he is the Christ. He is the Son of God. That is what we believe about Jesus. I also studied the prophecies about the Christ. Isaiah 53 was my favorite, still is. And then Psalm 22. And then I've gone through the time to find all the prophecies in the Old Testament about the Christ and read them all and study them all, and Jesus fulfilled them all. You know why Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies about the Christ? But it's because he is the Christ. I believe this by faith. Romans says, chapter 10, verse 17, very succinctly, so the faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith does not come by you being zapped with irresistible grace. Faith comes because you have spent time with the word of God, opening it up and reading it. And you've read about the birth of Christ. You've read about his miracles. You've read about his crucifixion. You've read about his resurrection. And you believe it's the truth. And because you believe it's the truth about Jesus, it leads to the conclusion that he must be who he says he is. He is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. Over in Acts chapter 8, verse 37, here you have the conversion of an Ethiopian eunuch. And... Uh, Philip is preaching to him about Jesus from the book of Isaiah 53. And then it says, then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In the Bible class, at the very close of it, I was talking about, is it important to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? <laughs> Absolutely. You can't be a Christian without it. You need to believe in God. You need to believe the Bible is actually the Word of God. And then when you study the word of God, it is going to lead you to Jesus. It's John arrow pointed to Jesus. And uh, it's going to lead you to realize, wow, a virgin birth did take place. And Jesus is the son of God. And the Messiah that's prophesied about in the Old Testament, that's Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one of God. He is the king of the kingdom. And I confess that to anybody, and I believe it with all my heart. How'd I get there? Not mom and dad just because it's what they said, although they believed it. I believe it because of the word of God. That's how I got to my faith. Everybody here who has the same faith, that's how you got there. But for you to be a Christian, 
For you to be allowed to be baptized for the remission of your sins, you have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The Ethiopian eunuch, he made that confession. He and Philip went down into the water, and Philip baptized. Now, Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart one believes unto righteousness, and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. So here's something else that we must believe in order to be a Christian. We believe that after Jesus was crucified for our sins, he was buried. And we believe that three days later, he rose from the dead. I have read the witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus, and I believe they're telling me the truth. So you see how that works? I was talking about what is truth. I believe they're telling me the truth about the birth of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. This is the believing aspect of faith. Believing the truth about God and the truth about Jesus. Then we have the trusting aspect of faith. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean out on your own understanding. Trust has to do, again, with confidence and assurance that what you are being told is the truth. That what you're being told is the truth. And you can have confidence and assurance and conviction. This is true. This is the truth. It's not a lie. Those of us that are Christians have confidence and trust that what we have revealed to us in the scriptures is the truth. In Ephesians chapter 1, 12 through 14, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom having also believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you see, they heard the word. It starts with the word. It always starts with the word. They heard the word. They believed the word. And they trusted. They trusted that what they were hearing in the word is the truth. It always comes back to what is the truth. They believed it. They trusted in it. When you go over to Acts chapter 27, here's another good example of it. The Apostle Paul is on a boat in the middle of the, sea, of the Mediterranean Sea. He's in the middle of a storm. God reveals to him that they're going to go to an island. They're going to crash in an island. Uh, but everybody's got to stay on the boat. And if everybody stays on the boat, nobody will die. I want you to see Paul's reaction. He says, therefore take heart, man, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told me. I want to use that particular verse because I'm wanting you to see that's what trust is. You are believing it is going to be exactly the way God told you it's going to be. We're dealing with things in the future, folks. Things that are coming. And we believe it's going to turn out exactly the way God said it. Let's go further with this. We just sang this, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he's able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. I hope you don't mind this, but I'm going to use gambling terms here. Keeping what you've committed to God. What have you committed to God through Jesus Christ? You have put your soul's eternal destiny on the table, folks. I'm committing to God through Jesus Christ that what you have told me about how I can be reconciled to you, how I can be forgiven by you, how I can have access to your grace by faith, I'm putting it all on the table, God. And I have total trust that you have done what you have said you have done in forgiving me of my sins, that you will do what you say you will do in rising me from the dead to be with you in heaven. Do you see how that works? Paul here, coming to the close of his life, total confidence, total trust that it's going to be exactly 
the way God said it would be through Jesus Christ. That's faith, trusting. That what you've been told, what's coming, is going to be exactly the way God said it's going to be. Hebrews says, chapter 10, 35 to 36, Therefore, you're not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. If you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Do you see how this gets back to the definition of faith? Go back to the definition. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The idea of assurance is full assurance. Again, back in chapter 10, 22. Full assurance is going to be that way. Conviction is going to be that way. I'm hoping for it. It's not here yet, but I believe it's coming. Total confidence. Total trust. Do not cast away your confidence. Hold on to your confidence in God's truth. What he told us is coming. It's coming. <laughs> it's real. It's true. And folks, it's coming. So let's talk about what's coming. And that takes us to the next aspect of faith. And that's godly fear. Ecclesiastes. Chapter 12, 13, and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. This is the conclusion of Solomon's great revelation on wisdom. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. What does he mean when he says, Fear God. I'm going to give you a good Mississippi, that's where I'm from, by the way, a Mississippi definition of fear God. What it means is, fear God. It means what it says, folks. Fear God. Why? The very next verse tells you why. For judgment's coming, folks. Judgment's coming. And I'm going to stand before God Almighty and I'm going to have to give account of all of my deeds and all of my sins. How does that make you feel? Okay, I asked the question, so I'm going to answer it. Afraid. Why? Because I've sinned and I know I deserve to go to hell. That's why. That's why all of us who have the fear of judgment have it. Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and we know it. But if you are living in sin, and you're not even seeking to be reconciled to God, you need to believe the warning of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 on this. Hebrews 11 and verse 7 talking about Noah. By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith. Noah was divinely warned of God about the flood. Flood like that had never come. He believed the warning of God. Moved by, look at that, godly fear. You think about this. It took over 100 years to build the ark. Every tree he cut down, he cut down by faith. Every tree he hauled with his sons and put in place, he did that by faith. With godly fear because he believed what God had told him was coming, is coming. You see how that trust comes in? God told you what's coming. God tells you what's coming. Do you trust him? Do you have faith that he's telling you the truth about what's coming? Now let's put it into practice. God warned Noah about the flood. God has warned us about hell. Simple question. Do you believe in hell? Yes or no? Thank you. Years ago when I lived in Louisiana, there was a gentleman that I'd been working trying to convert for months. And uh, he got very sick and very ill. He was going to the hospital. And I knew very, very well he wasn't going to come out of the hospital this time. And so I went to him one last time on his deathbed, and when I walked in the door, he said, I know what you're here for, preacher, get on with it. I said, you're right, I'm here trying to convince you to obey the gospel before you're going to die, because you're going to die soon. And so I talked to him about heaven. 
I talked to him about the resurrection. I talked to him about being with God. I talked to him about eternal life. And after I finished all that, he said, uh, that's okay, but it doesn't convince me to want to be a Christian. And so I just said, okay, I'll go to the other side of the coin. And so I started talking to him about hell and eternal torment and the fire and being forever separated from God with no hope of reconciliation. And he looked up at me and he said, I think I can deal with that. He's not dealing with it. I assure you, he died in sin. He's not dealing with it. Folks, we need to wake up. Hell is real. Judgment is coming. We're going to stand before God Almighty. We're going to have to give account of our actions. And if there's sin still standing between us and God, we will spend eternity in hell. Let me ask you, does hell scare you? Yes, more than anything. I would even go as far as saying godly fear is sometimes some of the earliest manifestations of faith in the heart of an individual. I'll explain it to you this way. When I was about seven years old, my sister was 11, we were in a gospel meeting. The preacher got up and preached a sermon on hell. My sister and I were so afraid, we went home and baptized our dog. That's the truth. That's my sister. We didn't want our dog to go to hell. Often you will find young people who believe what we're telling them about judgment in hell. And it scares them. And they start sensing that godly fear. And they don't want to go to hell. They don't want to be in the burning the fire. And they say, can I get baptized? I've come across this often. And so I need to ask you some questions. What do you believe about Jesus? And they kind of look at me like, what? What do you mean what I believe about Jesus? Can you explain what it means when it says he's the Christ? Uh, no. Can you tell what it means when he says he's the Son of God? Well, no, but I want to be baptized. Do you understand what repentance is? No, but I want to be baptized. My own children did that. That's how I know this happened. And every one of my children, I all said to all three of them, I need to study with you. Because you've got to understand, there's a whole lot more to this being a Christian than not going to hell. And there's things you must believe before you're allowed to become a Christian. And there's things you must be willing to commit to in repentance before you become a Christian. And so I began studying with them and studying with them and studying with them about who Jesus is and why we believe it. And studying with him, studying with him about what repentance is and what it is and why you do it and how you do it. And at the end of the year, after studying with him, when they came to him and they said, Daddy, I want to be baptized. And I said, what do you believe about Jesus? And they said, he's the Christ, he's the Son of the living God. Are you willing to repent? Yes, let's go to the water. Godly fear is often the earliest manifestation of faith, even in young people. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God, except look at this, with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. What are we talking about here? Consuming fire? Again, judgment. It's real. It's coming. Hell is real. If you have never cried out to God in desperation because of your sin, God, don't let me go to hell. I have to ask you, why not? Why haven't you cried out to God not to let you go to hell? Are you afraid of it or not? Do you believe in it or not? This is a major aspect of faith, trusting in the warning of God and being moved by godly fear to keep his commandments. But then there's the other side of it, the hope of faith. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, gird up your loins of your mind and be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Woo, man, you got a whole sermon right there, Chris. Look at this. Your hope upon the grace. I told you earlier, we're saved by grace. God has having mercy on us, forgiving us of our sins, and not only that, he's showing us grace and wanting to give us spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ. And these spiritual blessings are going to be revealed at the time Jesus comes. The resurrection. Eternal life. Heaven. Look at these with me. In 1 Peter again, chapter 1, verse 21. Who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope are in God. Stop right there. Oh, what a great verse. My faith and my hope are not in me. I'm not going to make it to heaven because of oh, how good I finally am. You need to understand this, folks. When we sin, after that, our whole relationship with God is grace. From that point forward, for all eternity. My hope lies totally in God and his mercy and his grace. My hope lies in Jesus Christ's sacrifice and the power of his blood, not in me. Trying to put it more simply and directly. If you think you're earning your way to heaven, stop it. Just stop it. You've already messed up. You've already sinned. We're going to go to heaven because of the mercy and the grace of God. And God's willingness to forgive us. Acts 24. Verse 23, verse 15. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So here again, I have confidence. I have trust. I have conviction. I have assurance. You see how all these are saying the same thing different ways? I have assurance that what God has told me about the resurrection coming in the future, folks, it is real. It is the truth. It's coming. I have total confidence and trust in the promise of the resurrection. Colossians, chapter 1, verse 5. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, so, I haven't seen heaven. I've read about it in the scriptures. So I asked you earlier, do you believe in hell? I hope you all said yes. Do you believe in heaven? Oh, yes. I believe heaven is real. I do not believe it is a myth. It is not something Christians have fabricated to make people feel better at funerals. It's real, folks. We are going to heaven. Please let that sink in. God is willing to forgive us of our sins. God is willing to let us be reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. God is not only willing to forgive us of our sins, he's willing to raise us to eternal life, to be with him in heaven. When you think about heaven, what do you think about? I'll be honest with you. I really don't think about gold streets. I don't think about a mansion. I don't think about any of that at all. I'll tell you what heaven is, folks. Heaven is being with God. Heaven is being with Jesus Christ. I don't care if I live in a cave. I just want to be where my God is. I just want to be with my Lord Jesus Christ. And wherever that is, and however that is, that's heaven. That's heaven. And it's real. And I have a true hope in it. Let's go further. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. But what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Look at this. Is not even you... In the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. What a great verse. This is one of my favorite verses in the book of Thessalonians. You know what my hope is? You know what my joy is? I enjoy being with you now. This is great, folks. But my hope and my true joy is when we're in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ before the throne of God Almighty. And I look around. And you are there. And I look around, there's Matt, and my wife, there's Kyle, there's Bonnie. Folks, it's real! It's coming! We are going to be in heaven. We are going to be before God Almighty, our Creator. We are going to be before Jesus Christ, our King. And we are going to be together. And we will never die again.
No more funerals. No more funerals. No more death. No more sorrow. No more tears. I believe it. I have hope. Last verse on this section. Titus 3, 7. Having been justified by his grace, we have become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We've talked about the hope of the resurrection, the hope of heaven, eternal life. I can't even get my brain wrapped around that. You know why? I got a watch on my hand. I see a clock on the back wall. I ask you, how old are you? And I tell you, yeah, we are old. We're getting older. In heaven, there won't be a watch or a clock. You won't ever ask anybody how old they are. Eternal life is the gift of God. Do you realize how awesome the grace of God is? Our hope is in heaven. Our hope is in the resurrection. Our hope is in eternal life. Our hope is in God. And now the last part of faith. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. <clears throat> now by faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. These are the attributes of faith that are driving us in our relationship with God. Faith, hope, and love. The strongest level your love will ever get to. Excuse me, say it right, Wayne. The strongest level your faith will ever get to is love. Did you get that? The strongest level your faith will ever get to is love for God. This is what our God is wanting of us. He is wanting us to love him, who we've never seen, with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, all the time. How can you love a God whom you've never seen? 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. Then he goes on back in verse 16 of the same chapter. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. I asked you earlier when we were doing the Lord's Supper, and I told you, if Jesus is not the Son of God, what does his death mean? The answer is nothing. He's just another Jew the Romans killed. But when you realize and understand Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Son of God, then his death on the cross is everything. And what God is doing to us, he is crying out to us as loudly as he can. I love you. I love you so much. He gave his son to die for me. I'm sorry, Kyle. You're just the first one I looked at. You love me, don't you? I love you too. Would you give Henry for me? What? You would not give Henry for me. I thought you loved me. I could have done that with any of you parents or grandparents. I love all of you very much. You're my family. You're my brethren. I would not give any of my children for any of you. You know why? I don't love you that much. God does love you that much. Look at the verse here. Do you know do you believe the love that God has for you? <laughs> Focus on Christ crucified. Come to understand that through this, God is crying out to you as loudly as he can. I love you. Let's continue. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifest toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might, have, might live through him. How did God show his love to you? He gave his only son to die for you. Let's look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 now. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I love the last part of that verse. Well, you, you, do you see what Paul is doing here? He is personalizing and individualizing the love of Christ for him. Jesus loved him so much, he gave himself for Paul. Please do this. 
personalize the sacrifice and the love of Jesus Christ for you. Personalize and realize he came to this earth in the form of flesh and blood for me. He allowed himself to be beaten for me. He allowed himself to be scourged. He was marred more than anyone. Blood pouring out everywhere. Every stripe that came upon his body was for me. He allowed himself to be nailed to a cross in a slow six-hour torturing death for me. I had never seen the man, but I love him more than anyone because I know and I believe the love that he has for me. Love for God is the highest level our faith will ever get to. This is what God is desiring of us. A faith that believes. A faith that trusts. A faith that has godly fear in the warnings of God. A faith that has hope in the promises of God. And finally, a faith that loves God. Let me show you the conclusion of this. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, look at this now, but faith working through love. You see that? When you have a faith that is working through love, when you have a love that is keeping his commandments, let's go even back to what we looked at earlier. Remember back in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 36? After you've done the will of God, if you have a faith that does the will of God, Going to Ecclesiastes, you remember that? Chapter 12, verse 13. Fear God and keep his commandments. Are you seeing the pattern? Love God, keep his commandments. Fear God, keep his commandments. Trust God, keep his commandments. That's the result of faith. Faith working through love. Keep his commandments because you love him. Faith working through love. All right, let's tie it all together now. Let your brain rest five seconds. We are saved by grace through faith. We have access to the grace of God through faith. But the faith has to be a faith that is trusting, a faith that has confidence in the conviction and trust, a faith that has godly fear in the warnings, a faith that has hope in the promises, a faith that loves. And when you have this kind of faith, by that kind of faith, you are keeping his commandments. By that kind of faith, you live and you walk by faith. Not a dead faith, but a living faith. And with a living faith, you and I have access to the grace of God. And by that grace, we are saved. I thank you for your kind attention. If there's anybody here this morning who's not in Christ yet. Who do you say that he is? Do you remember the question of the youth, Ethiopian eunuch? Here's water. What's preventing me or hindering me from being baptized? If you believe with all your heart, you may. You must believe he is the Christ. You must believe he is the Son of God. Be willing to openly confess that. You must believe he died on the cross for your sins and he was buried and rose again the third day. If you're willing to openly confess your faith and make the commitment of repentance and it's the biggest commitment of your life, the water's right here behind me. And we will baptize you into the body of Christ for the remission of your sins as quickly as we can. What does God expect of us who are already in Christ? You live by faith. You walk by faith. You keep his commandments by godly fear. You keep his commandments by love. Faith working through love. In the end, brethren, that's what's going to save our souls, giving us access to the grace of God. If you're in Christ already and there's sin between you and your God, deal with the sin. Don't let sin stand between you and God, especially realizing if you die in that sin, you'll be separated from God. The brethren here will pray for you, they'll pray with you. They'll do the best they can to try to encourage you and strengthen you. Do not leave the building lost. If there's any way whatsoever we can assist you, let us know while we stand and sing the song that has been selected.